welcome to the Jackson Hole China Forum for this uh, forum. And uh, we are very, very happy that uh, Dr. Uh, Larry and Jonathan will uh, talk about his experiences in China, talking to Chinese uh, leaders, uh, Chinese uh, colleagues about uh, the Western Point leadership concept. Uh, Dr. Donovan has been uh, in the military for many years, was in the military for many years, and also was a professor at uh, Western Point. Uh, after he retired from the West Point, he moved to Denver. So we are very happy to uh, have him in Denver. And uh, he was the president of the Colorado Catholic University for a while. And uh, I think you left that position last year, was it? Oh, it was uh, three or four years ago. Oh, three or four years ago. And uh, he has traveled to China a lot to talk about the West Point leadership concept because of the Chinese uh, uh, intellectuals and Chinese uh, elite. The West Point, Xi Dian Jun Xiao Chang said that, is a very big American military uh, school. They are very, very uh, curious about uh, what's going on there, how they train their cadets, their officers. In fact, I remember some years ago, I have a colleague uh, who uh, now is teaching at uh, Georgia Tech. He, he's a Chinese American. He spent one year as a professor at West Point. Then he wrote a book about my one year experience in West Point. That book in Chinese so so well in China because uh, people in China are really interested in the West Point uh, experiences. So, uh, we are very happy that uh, Dr. Jonathan will talk about his experiences, how the Chinese responded to his uh, presentations of uh, West Point concept of leadership. Talking about leadership, the Chinese understanding of leadership and the American understanding of leadership is so different. <coughs> when I was in China talking to people in leadership, they always think, oh, what you call, you give a commander, you give order. So I try to explain them very differently. That's why I'm so, so glad that and Dr. Donaldson can talk about that like a nerd. So please join me to welcome Dr. Donaldson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Sam, thank you very much for your invitation. Dr. Jia has been very kind to invite me to come and speak with you today. Uh, he and I were passing at the airport. I think we've got on the same train <laughs> going from uh, one of the outer um, terminals uh, into the, the baggage area, and they got to talking, and I, I reminded him that I was doing all this teaching of leadership, and he said, well, come tell us about the reactions that you've had, and I've had wonderful reactions. It's been a wonderful experience for me teaching leadership uh, in China, and so I'm delighted to, to share that with you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. What, what you see here is one of the audiences uh, that I spoke to on my most recent trip. It was a, a long trip. I spoke to about 12 audiences in 12 different uh, cities. And this is one of them. Uh, my very first audience in China, about five or six years ago, was here. The first audience in People's Republic. This was at Tsinghua University, and I was speaking to a group who were primarily um, business CEOs within the real estate development. Let me use this as a backdrop to talk about what I would like to do today. Um, I want to just talk about how I came to be teaching uh, in China, just a, a few words on that. And then I thought that I would give you kind of a capsule summary of what I teach. Um, sometimes it, it takes three days, so for me to squeeze three days down to 30 minutes is of course going to be leaving out a great deal of, of what I would love to, to teach about leadership. But I just want to give you kind of a, a sampler, a tasting, so that you have a sense of the character of the leadership education that I offer. And then from that, I'm going to invite you 
to speculate about what you think are the reactions from Chinese audiences to that character of leadership education. And then I'll also uh, share with you my uh, summary of the reactions that I have experienced, and then we'll just open the floor. So I will take maybe 30 minutes to introduce you to what I've been teaching, and then we'll try to move to questions and answers after that. How did I get started doing this? This again is a picture from my very first uh, um, audience in People's Republic, uh, again, Tsinghua University. And let me just give you a summary of some of the things. Been going to China, starting with Taiwan in 2006, and then People's Republic in 2007, and going uh, once or twice each year uh, since 2006. And the reason for that it really is the book that I um, wrote and published published by Random House, Doubleday at the time, uh, called The West Point Way of Leadership. And I'll say more about that in a minute, but that's the reason that I have been invited, is because of the book, which uh, caused people to get in touch with me and invite me to come. The audiences have been quite varied. Large business leadership teams, large companies. One uh, company on this last trip had 300 leaders, uh, intermediate to executive leaders whom they brought into a big auditorium, and I spoke with them for three days. And um, then at the same time, on the same trip, I had a group of 70 executives uh, in Beijing. So it ranges from 70, one year in Shenzhen, we had an audience of 1,200 uh, people. Um, sometimes it's small businesses. Uh, I've been to Qingtao twice to a small business there, has spoken with all of those in leadership and to the entire company uh, on one occasion. Um, duration of lectures. Sometimes it's two or three hours, sometimes as much as three days. And I love it. The more time I can get, the better. Uh, I love the subject, and I love to teach, and I, I love the responses, the reactions from our audiences. So I take as much time as they will give me. And then Locations have been widespread within China as well, within the People's Republic, from Beijing to Shanghai, Kunming to Hoha, Chenyong to Shenzhen, Qingdao to Chengdu and Xichang, and uh, many other cities. I think I, I looked at the back of an air, airline, one of the China airlines, and looked at the cities they serviced, and I realized I'd been in 20 or 25 of the major cities in the People's Republic. Um, on these trips, sometimes my wife and I take time to go touring, and this is one of the wonderful trips. This is Potala Palace in Lhasa, Tibet, and this is my wife here in the foreground. This is the chart that I use to introduce the leadership talks that I give, and it's a way of, of introducing myself. This is me when I was in my first six months at West Point as a new first-year cadet many years ago. This is when I was a full colonel on the staff and faculty working for the superintendent. And he had me uh, coordinating a series of studies to determine whether every experience that a West Point cadet had during their 46 months as a cadet, whether that was optimized to produce the, the most effective leadership development and character development that we could arrange. And I was uh, coordinating those studies for about five years for him when he was asked by Doubleday to write a book about West Point leadership. And because of the work I was doing for him, he said, well, it's not appropriate for me to do it, but I've got a guy who will. So he told me to write the book, and I did. And this was the result. It wasn't written because I thought I had anything to say. It was written because my boss told me to. And it has been in print ever since, and this is the Chinese translation from the China Social Sciences Press. And then this is uh, um, when I was president of a university here in town. I, prior to that, I was president of a community college in North Carolina, and then came to Denver for my second college presidency. Throughout that time, I've been teaching leadership. 
Now my first trip to China. Uh, do you recognize my wife? She is much younger here. <laughs> we were in Shenzhen. We had gone to Hong Kong, and it was just after the opening up. And we were able to get a visa immediately to go into the People's Republic and went to Shenzhen. This was 1981. If uh, some of the Chinese in the room, I often say, if you're under 30 years old, then I went to China before you did. <laughs> I, in the audiences that I speak to in China, I take them to West Point very quickly, acknowledging how much I enjoy being in China and touring China. Then I take them halfway around the world to West Point. This is a picture of the United States Military Academy. And it sits out here on a point. This is the Hudson River. It comes down and makes a sharp turn, and there creates a point out here on the west bank of the river. So it's been known geographically as West Point ever since its founding more than 200 years ago. Now let me take you down. And um, as I do with Chinese audiences, I give them just a quick tour of what it feels like to be a cadet. Here you are entering on your first day at West Point looking a little bit anxious, a little bit uh, concerned about what's going to happen to me next. And your mother looks the same way as she hugs you goodbye. And then you meet a cadet, a higher ranking cadet, who's in his or her third year, and that cadet is giving you instructions on what's going to happen next. And you go and uh, you're issued a bunch of uniforms and equipment, and you walk over to your barracks and meet your new leader, an upper-class cadet who is your leader for the summer of training. Get that first <laughs> military haircut. This fellow needed it pretty badly. <laughs> and you learn how to salute, you learn how to march, you learn how to put on the uniform. And then, still on that first day, you march out to Trophy Point and take an oath. You are now entering the United States Army and you're going to serve your nation faithfully in that role. That all occurs on the first day that you take this oath. Dwight D. Eisenhower said that uh, the first day, if he had had time to stop and think about it, he probably would have left. But he didn't have time to think about it. So he stayed. And that changed the history of our country because he did stay. For the rest of the year, cadets live in a room that looks uh, rather barren. It's pretty simple. They eat in a large dining hall. They eat family style at a table for 10. This is only half of the dining hall that you see in this picture. Cadets are constantly under pressure to be staying in good physical condition. They are you know, required to participate in a team sport two seasons out of three every year. They are engaged in military training throughout the 46 months that they are at West Point. It is fairly light during the academic year. They continue marching through most of the academic year. And then the intensive military trainings during the summer. During the regular academic year, the uh, program is a very robust curriculum of math, science, and engineering, as well as humanities and social sciences. It does involve a good bit of problem solving. Cadets at West Point are encouraged to engage in, in religious uh, worship, and there are three different uh, structures for that, and all faiths contained uh, or held by cadets are uh, supported by the chaplains under United States law, which has been tested in the Supreme Court. During the summers, military training, some of it at West Point, some of it away from West Point, and then, one of the summers, by your third summer, you actually become a leader for those new cadets. So you see that now in your third year, you're the guy giving the instructions to the new cadets. <coughs> you're teaching them how to salute, how to wear their uniform, and all of that. And by your senior year, you are actually in the leadership of the entire Corps of Cadets. And as seniors, by the end of your senior year, your fourth year at West Point, you have gone from here to here in 46 months. You go forward and receive a diploma, a Bachelor of Science degree, and then you stand up and take another oath. 
Now you'll be entering the United States Army as a second lieutenant. And again, take an oath to promise that you will faithfully serve your nation in that role as a lieutenant of the United States Army. Well, this is the West Point experience. And now at this stage in the leadership training in China, I take folks back to this scene and invite them to look at this scene. You're seeing this grand panorama where the cadets march. In a way, it's a, like a grand stage on which they conduct their military parades. And on this grand stage, if you look from right to left through that whole thing, you see only one statue. And it's at the very center of that grand stage. Let me point it out to you here. Who do you think deserves to be at the center of the stage at West Point? Many Chinese audiences are very good at guessing who that is. What? George Washington? Yes, it is. George Washington. This is a close-up of that same statue. And could I ask, why is George Washington at the center? Some guess it's because he must have founded the military academy. No, he did not. He wanted to, but he was talked out of it by his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson who became the third president of the United States, and Thomas Jefferson was the one who founded West Point. And it's very interesting to discuss why Jefferson talked Washington out of it, and then he himself did it to found a military academy. But we won't take time for that today. The reason that George Washington is at the center is because of the character of his leadership. He was the leader in the United States Revolution, by which the colonies placed on the east coast of the, of the North American continent, the revolution by which those colonies broke free of England and became an independent nation. George Washington led the army that fought that revolutionary war. And when he took the position, he was risking, risking his reputation, which was very strong, he was risking his substantial wealth, which he had acquired through his marriage. He was also risking his life, because if he'd been captured, he would have been executed as a traitor to King George of England. So this is a man who for eight years set aside all personal consideration in order to pursue and lead a cause that he believed in, something greater than himself something that he believed in more than he believed in his own life. And he was willing to risk all of that to pursue that greater cause. And it's that kind of example. It's leadership where we set aside self-interest and pursue the good of others. A greater idea, something greater than yourself that's worth pursuing. It's that kind of leadership that is exemplified by this statue at West Point and the kind of leadership that West Point attempts to teach to all of its students. And I point out that China has similar exemplars of leadership. Song Zhongshan, was, uh, his photo was in the background when I spoke in Taiwan. His statue is also at a wonderful memorial site in Guangzhou, which I have visited because of my interest in Song Zhongshan. And here are some of the Here's a close-up of his statue. And some of the things that he wrote, three principles of the people, anti-imperialist nationalism, democracy, socialism, or the people's livelihood. And he said in his most famous book, the multitude of the people will build the richest and happiest country in the world, a country of the people, by the people, and for the people. I'd like to... Define leadership. As we go forward in, in leadership training, it's important to understand what we're talking about. And I, I love to talk with Chinese audiences about how to define it. One way I like to define it is just to go back to my beginning uh, as a young second lieutenant. When I was um, commissioned from West Point, my first job was in South Vietnam, in Bao Lok. And um, I became the company commander, the, the leader, of 150 engineer soldiers. Here's a picture of 
some of those men who were under my leadership at that time. Well, the major job we were working on while I was there was building an airfield. Uh, a situation that was presented to me was this. I came upon this situation where this bridge had been blown up by the enemy. You can see that the bridge has fallen down into the river that it crossed. And as I looked at that, this was not only a situation where the bridge was no longer functional, but there were 150 trucks backed up on the road. And they were all carrying vegetables from several thousand farmers in the highlands of Vietnam. And they were on their way, if only they could get across this bridge, they were on their way down to the population centers of Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City now, uh, where millions of people depended upon them to supply their food. So this situation is, in one respect, a way of defining leadership for me. Because as I stood there and looked at this scene, I could only imagine, I could only envision in my mind, a better situation where we had replaced this bridge with a functional bridge that was going to get those hundreds of trucks moving to deliver all that food from thousands of farmers to millions of people who were waiting. This is the vision I had in my mind, and it actually came to pass after a few days. But looking at that vision of a functional bridge that's carrying not only a bulldozer, but will carry all of those trucks full of vegetables, Moving from this state of affairs to this better state of affairs required a team effort. I could not possibly have done it by myself. It could only happen through all of these men who were in my company. But together, we could move from this situation to this. And so when you back up and think about it, Leadership begins with a purpose, a goal, a task, a mission, something worth doing, a way of improving life for other people. And then there is that group of people through whom you have any possibility of fulfilling this transformation of reality. And leadership is exercising our interpersonal influence to bring together purpose and people. So as to meet the needs of the people and to fulfill the purpose that brought them together. And that's what I define as leadership. It's not a complicated idea, but it's a robust idea. It's moving from one situation to another where you improve a lot of life for other people through the exercise of interpersonal influence upon those who have gathered for this particular purpose. If you agree that this is a reasonable definition of leadership, then how do we get there? How do we develop leaders who will be effective at bringing together purpose and people? I propose that there are two broad categories, each of which is necessary but not sufficient. One of those is we have to develop the skills, technique, the knowledge, the abilities that pertain to the particular venue in which we'll be leading. If I want to be a leader in education, I need to understand education. If I'm going to be a leader in the newspaper business, I have to be competent in the technical task requirements of the newspaper publishing world and so forth. But that is necessary but not sufficient to effective leadership. There also has to be a second category, that in developing the heart, the character, the personality, the outlook on life that the leader has. Again, developing the character in the heart is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We have to have both. If I only have a strong heart and character, I become simply an ideologue, someone with great ideas who can't bring it into being. But if I have only the skill, technique, and knowledge, I can mislead people. Instead of being a leader, I would be a misleader, like Hitler or Stalin, and of course many others in, in history. 
So both of these categories are essential, and together they are sufficient to ensure the development of effective leaders. Now, I like to move from here where I've got two broad categories and be more specific about how I would fill in those two categories. I'm going to show you five character attributes and six skills, which I think represent a very good approach to developing leaders. Here they are. Here are the five character attributes, and I'll say more about these. And these are the six skills that I propose if we undertake to develop these and to continue developing these in young leaders over an entire career that they cannot help but become more and more effective in their roles as leaders. And so what I do is to urge people to let me just give you just a, an incentive to start developing each of these 11 areas of your life, knowing that it's almost certain that is, as you work on developing these, you will become more effective in leadership. Now, there are several <coughs> paradigms by which we can understand leadership development. I just showed you, in this chart, I showed you in this chart, I showed you 11, uh, come on down, can't back up very quickly, can I? Here are 11 ways of developing leadership. Now, I want to show you an, a different paradigm for thinking about leadership development. Not that we're going to leave these 11 behind, but that these 11 are going to be developed through four different stages of leadership. Leadership development begins with followership. For those of you who don't read Chinese, I apologize. I don't have the English on here. This is followership. And I don't read it either. I don't pretend I do. Followership is where leadership begins. Because it's leading one person. Until I demonstrate that I can lead myself and manage myself effectively toward the accomplishment of the goals of my organization, I really cannot pretend to take on responsibility for guiding others toward the achievement of the goals of my organization. So leadership begins with followership, where I am responsible just for myself and managing myself to accomplish the goals of my organization. And after I demonstrate that I can manage myself well, then I take responsibility for leading a small group of others in face-to-face -face leadership, where it's a small group a handful of people whom I see every day, I can influence them face to face. But if I get promoted again, then I move into managing a group of those people who are face to face leaders. For the first time, I become a leader of other leaders. I call this indirect leadership. And if I keep moving up in an organization, eventually I become the leader of the entire organization. So these are four levels of leadership. Leading myself, leading others, leading leaders, leading organizations. Leading myself, leading others, leading leaders, leading organizations. At each of those stages, I have to add additional skills and understanding to enable me to be effective at that next level of leadership. Never leaving behind, simply adding an additional level of responsibility to my leadership. What I want to do now is just to give you one highlight from each of these four, and then we'll go back to the 11 executive characteristics that I showed you. Followership, from a classic article by Robert Kelly. He said, when we're looking for followers in a company, there are two scales on which we want to judge them. Are they active or passive? Do they take initiative on, them, on their own, or do they sit and wait to be told what to do? Secondly, are they active thinkers? Are they critical thinkers? Are they independent thinkers? Are they watching what's going on and thinking about what needs to be done? And of course, this yields four different kinds of followers. Those who don't take any initiative and don't know what needs to be done, they simply do what they're told. This person is active, 
But he has to be told what to do because he's not really very thoughtful about it. You have to give this person a lot of guidance. Thirdly, this is the person who's probably the most dangerous because this is someone who's very thoughtful and, and understands what needs to happen in the company but does not take initiative, doesn't do anything about it. This is your chronic complainer who says, boy, somebody around here ought to do something about that instead of getting up and doing something himself or herself. So I urge that you find a job for that person in your competitor's company. <laughs> Lastly, this is gold. The individual who is willing to take the initiative and who is already thinking about what needs to be done. You know these people. They get up and help. And I'm sitting there watching and somebody else gets up and they help. They see something was needed, they get up and they do it. Those are the people we want in our organizations. That's the follower whom we want to recruit into our company and whom we want to develop within our company. Let's move to face-to-face -to -face leadership. At West Point, we wrote 15 principles for guiding how cadets should treat those who were their followers. And those uh, principles are still being used today. Let me just show you two of them. Principle number two, make clear to your followers what you expect of them. Demanding but achievable standards are actually expressions of confidence in followers. And then, make sure that they know how to do that. First of all, do they know it's their job? And secondly, do they know how to do their job? Do they have the skill? Are you providing them the feedback that they need in order to be good at that job? Leaders are terrible at giving feedback, especially when it's negative. We don't like to say, Susie, you know, I need for you to do this differently. You're not doing it quite right. Let me show you how I want this done. We don't like to do that. It's hard. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? But it's a responsibility that we have to our followers to give them feedback, especially <coughs> when it's corrective feedback. Principle number 10, leaders accept mistakes, affording followers opportunities to learn through experience. And followers, in turn, strive to learn those lessons well. Let's move from face-to-face -face leadership to indirect leadership. This is where I've been promoted, and I am leading other leaders for the first time. And so now I have an obligation to be respecting the chain of command and to be developing my followers in their roles as leaders teaching them how to lead effectively. I now have an additional responsibility. <clears throat> I have to delegate more. It will be a temptation to go down and do what I was able to do so well when I was a face-to-face -face leader. But now I have to delegate much of that to those who work for me. Finally, loyalty upward and downward. I am kind of in the middle of the organization. I have a responsibility to be loyal in representing my followers to my boss. But I also have a responsibility to be loyal in representing my boss faithfully to my followers. And I have to develop a refined sense of judgment as to when my duty is to my boss or when it is to my followers to represent them well. What are the obligations of indirect leadership? Now I'm going to move to the organizational leader the executive leader. And now we go back to that earlier chart where there are six skills that need to be developed. But I want to begin here by going back to this chart, the five character attributes. Let's begin with authenticity. Authenticity, the capacity as a leader to be honest and transparent to others about who the leader is and what the leader is thinking. This is incredibly hard and incredibly important to effective leadership. Guzes and Posner wrote a book, had written many books on leadership, and for 30 years these two leadership gurus have been going around the world giving a survey. What would you like to see most in someone whom you would want to follow. And 
over the years, they have given that survey to thousands of people from every culture, every industry, every uh, walk of life. And invariably, this is the answers that they, that they get. 85% say, I want my leader to be honest. Secondly, forward-looking. Third, inspiring. Fourth, competent. But no matter where you go, people say, first of all, I want my leader to be honest. Just tell me the truth. Just tell me what you're thinking. Don't make me guess at what you're thinking. And certainly don't mislead me by what you say. <clears throat> um, Jim Burke. Jim Burke comes to my mind not because he was CEO of Johnson & Johnson and led them through the Tylenol crisis, but because Jim Burke failed in a major role as a leader within Johnson & Johnson. And he was able to survive that. In fact, his boss called him in and said, keep it up. We will live or die based on innovation. And we've got to be willing to stick our necks out and we're going to occasionally have a failure. But you've learned. And in fact, Jim Burke was one of those guys who was honest enough to learn from his mistake. Sometimes leaders want to deny that they've done anything wrong or that they were in any way responsible for a failure. But when a leader is willing to be honest even about their mistakes, it is very fruitful and productive. Another one, John Chambers, current CEO of Cisco, but he also was the one who led Wong Laboratories into oblivion. One year they made a billion dollars in profit, the next year they lost almost a billion in losses, and he had to lay off thousands of people. He learned. He was authentic enough to learn from his failure, and it has served him well in his leadership of Cisco since then. Trust. What is trust? Trust is a complicated word. Here's how I define it in terms of leadership. It is a characteristic of the relationship between the leader and the follower in which the follower trusts the leader to be fair and honest and that they will be safe under that person's leadership. Why do folks have to believe that they're safe? Because a lot of people have had experiences that make them feel not very safe in business organizations. So trust between the leader and the follower, an attribute. Tell a story, a true story, of a CEO who was briefed by a staff member, and he didn't like, he just nodded his head, and then when he dismissed the staff member, he told the staff member's boss to go fire him that day because he didn't like what he had briefed. Destroyed trust throughout a major company by doing so. It's really fun to use this as a case study and to talk about what happened there and what should have happened and what you would do if you were VP of marketing and so forth. Moving on, commitment. Commitment is defined this way. The leader being able to express passion for the cause that the company pursues. Sharing that passion so articulately, so effectively, that followers are inspired by it. They want to join this cause. And they realize that in joining the company, they're not just getting a job. They're acquiring a purpose in life, something worth doing. Imagine if George Washington had recruited you to the Revolutionary Army and inspired you to a cause that was worth devoting your life to. Care. Care is love for, even obsession with, what is best for both the people and the purpose. Remember, leadership is bringing together people and purpose. Well, caring is having a love for both those people and for that purpose, not oneself. I heard a line in the uh, movie Crimson Tide where Denzel Washington is a, a young naval officer and he's going to sea for the first time with his boss, this old uh, uh, hack, hackman character, 
And Hackman says to the young lieutenant this. Here's his advice. Don't spend your energy worrying about covering up your mistakes and trying to impress the boss. Instead, spend your energy worrying about the mission and the men, accomplishing the purpose and taking care of the people. That is such good advice. If I worry about taking care of the mission and the men, accomplishing the purpose, taking care of the people, all of the promotions take care of themselves, don't they? Lastly, courage. What is courage in the sense of a leadership attribute? It's a learned capacity of the leader to choose the harder right over the easier wrong. It enables the other attributes of the great leader. Courage to be myself, to be honest, without pretense, not concerned about what others think of me. Courage to be truthful even when it hurts, to provide that feedback to someone who needs it. Courage to live up to my highest core values, to act for what is right. Courage to learn from my past mistakes. Let's go from this list of attributes back to this chart where I said it takes not only attributes of character and heart, but also a variety of skills. And here is that list that I showed you earlier. Team building, communication, decision making, strategy, execution, and learning. Those six represent a fairly comprehensive list of the skills that I need. I'm just going to say a word about the first three, and then we'll wrap up and, and uh, talk further. Team building. Potential in teamwork, according to Patrick Lencioni. If you could get all the people in the organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. I like to teach teamwork using Patrick Lencioni's approach because he faces the fact that we as human beings have certain foibles that need to be overcome in order to have really effective teamwork. And the first one is an absence of trust. There's that word again, trust. Do I feel safe with the other people on my team? Without it, I'll be avoiding conflict. I will have fear of conflict. And if we don't have enough trust to argue with one another within the team, then we will have a lack of commitment to the decisions that have been made because we haven't really voiced all of the strengths and weaknesses of the options that we were debating. With a lack of commitment, we won't hold each other accountable. And if we can't hold each other accountable, we'll go stop paying attention to results. So these are the five dysfunctions of a team. And there is a way of dealing with each one of these over several days and months that uh, can be very effective for building a powerful team. Let's look at the second one, communication. And it, a vital skill for leaders because they've not, not only got to be able to speak to large groups in an inspirational way, but they've also got to be able to speak to individual employees with honesty and, and with courage. And many of the conversations they're going to have are difficult. They're hard conversations. So something like this book is a very effective tool for learning how to have those hard conversations. Let me give you just one example of a principle that they teach about having a hard conversation. <coughs> Look at this. Uh, this is a picture of a woman, a drawing of a woman. Do you see here a young, beautiful woman or an old woman who is not so pretty with a crooked nose? What? Oh, yeah. Can you make your mind switch back and forth? Can everybody see two women there? Mm -hmm. It's a very familiar chart. It emphasizes the idea <coughs> that one drawing can be interpreted multiple ways. That is, when we have an experience within the workplace, it can be interpreted. And there will be certain things that have been done, words that have been said, and how I interpret those, those observed facts, how I interpret those may actually be incorporated 
into my emotional state if I'm really unhappy with what it appears that an employee has done, and I've interpreted it as a significant failure on their part that cannot be explained, I will bring anger into my conversation with that other person. And their point is, go back to here, start the conversation with only this, and assume that you're probably going to hear a very good explanation for why that happened. Even if you don't hear a good explanation, you will hear some response that you can then work with in trying to overcome that. But if I start with observe facts and jump to my interpretation, I may well begin the conversation with an emotion that is not justified because I have misinterpreted what happened. Communication skills. This is only one of just touching upon just to, again, just to give you a sampling of the kind of thing that we can talk about in leadership development. Decision making. There are many aspects of decision making I love to talk about, but one of the most important is to deal with the ethical dimension. And it's fairly straightforward. You know, talking in philosophical terms, ethics is a wonderful subject, and it's very engaging. But when we're talking in leadership terms, we, we want a practical approach. And this is one way of doing that, to realize that every action, every decision I make, and every action I take has three dimensions that I need to consider. The action's consequences. Will those consequences result in more good for more people than any alternative? Secondly, the action itself has a certain inherent rightness or wrongness about it. Is it just? Is it fair? Is it true? Is it keeping a promise? Is it sustaining faith with those who are engaged? Those moral principles, truth-telling, promise-keeping, justice, beneficence. And then thirdly, there's the element of the actor. What about the actor? Are they acting on strong, positive, moral character, virtue, or not? These are three approaches which we can flesh out um, very helpfully for helping in the decision-making process. Um, we have to make choices. This is the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, and I love to use this example. Let's, in each of these little alcoves, there's a favorite son of Florence. And this guy, I'm going to show you in uh, closer detail here. Niccolò Machiavelli wrote The Prince, in which he said, the end justifies the means in the actions of men, especially of princes. And he exemplifies that by saying, don't keep a promise when it's no longer to your advantage. And I point out that's a philosophy of life that many people follow. But we should contrast Machiavelli's philosophy with that of another historical figure, Marcus Aurelius who in his journal said to himself, Marcus, never value anything for yourself which would compel you to break your promise. And he went on in that quote, but to stop right there. Machiavelli says, don't bother to keep a promise when it's no longer serving your end, no longer serves your advantage. And Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor of the known civilized world at the time, who was totally unrestrained except by his own self-discipline, says to himself, Marcus, never value anything so much that it would cause you to break your promise. Those are the two philosophies of life which are mutually exclusive. We can't be Marcus Aurelius and be Machiavelli, can we? And so all of us make a choice, either consciously or subconsciously, whether we're going to guide our life by principles of Machiavelli or of Marcus Aurelius. I use these older exemplars simply to say, this is nothing new. Making this choice is nothing new. It's been going on as long as we've had civilized human society choosing whether we will be followers of Marcus or of Machiavelli. I uh, have a friend, Dr. Wu Ying, He's a Chinese professor at uh, Southern California University. He sent me a paper recently in which he was promoting the uh, teaching of Kasuo Inamore, founder of Kyocera. And he suggests that there are three rulers by which we guide our lives or by which we decide what we are answerable to. Here are his three rulers and what they stand for. 
It's that concept by which I measure what I do, measure what I should do, measure what I value. It's an overarching perspective on life, an approach to life, a philosophy of life. And here are the three that uh, he includes in his paper. Am I answerable only to myself? Am I willing to be answerable to others? Am I willing to be answerable to the cosmos, to God, to a higher force, whatever you see? And in his paper, he suggests that moving from one ruler to the next is optional. It's a choice. But it is a big choice. It's a life-changing shift in orientation, a Kuhnsian paradigm shift. Thomas Kuhn's um, structure of scientific revolutions paradigm. So, um, again, an approach to what kind of person I will be. Last, I want to turn to Good to Great, Jim Collins' book, where he identified 11 companies which had gone from being really good, good enough to get on the Fortune 500 list, to becoming great companies. There were only 11 of them. And in all 11 companies, he found that they had an unusual leader. Without exception, all 11 companies had effective leaders who were unusual in that they had an intense professional will and they had extreme personal humility. They were others-centered leaders. They had moved to ruler two, at least, if not three. And it is an empirical outcome. He wasn't looking for this outcome. He discovered it by accident. When he found from empirical data 11 companies that had been extraordinary in their performance and earnings and productivity, and all 11 had an others-centered leader during the time of their expansion. He compared those 11 companies to other companies at the same time in the same industry and found that those leaders were very self-centered leaders. Okay, so this is my strategy for developing effective leaders. I believe this is how we can develop people who can use their interpersonal influence to bring together purpose and people to be effective as leaders. And this uh, is a very quick thumbnail summary of what I teach in China. So now, I want to turn back to you and ask you, with your knowledge of China, with this brief summary that I've offered you of the leadership education that I do, tell me, let's just chat. How do you think Chinese audiences will respond. Of course, there's a variety of responses. Just give me one. Give me one thought about how you think someone in a Chinese audience might respond. Okay, so we have one student to raise hand. Already. Yes. How could I do this without losing face? Yeah, right. Um, interesting. I, I'm sure that they're thinking that. They don't say that to me. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and... I'm always aware that they're thinking about that and trying to be responsive to that. But I've not actually had them come out and say, say it in those terms. I think the audience might be more interested in your answers to your own questions. <laughs> yeah. Because well, you were in China. Let me ask a couple of questions okay. to start using my privilege <laughs> here. Uh, why I uh, that day we saw each other on the airport. In fact, we knew each other before we went to China together. And also, Carl is here. Uh, we went together as a group, so that's why we have uh, known each other. And uh, that day, in fact, uh, he came back from Shanghai. I think remember in the airport. I came. Where I came from? Back from. I don't remember. But why I suddenly we talked about the issue. Uh, he came back from China talking about leadership. Then. Before that trip, I was in China and uh, talking about uh, Obama's policy to uh, um, uh, reorient or rebalance U.S. Uh, priority to Asia Pacific. One issue I talked about to Chinese audience was the uh, U.S. Uh, wanted to play a leadership role in Asia Pacific. Then one person from the audience stood up very angry at me. I said, why Americans should be leader, the leaders in the world. I mean, 
when they say leader, it's like Americans want, always want to have followers really? in Asia. And Americans, why Americans should give orders to us? So I try to answer that question because I try to say, oh, in the US, when we say leadership, somehow it's not the concept uh, you think in the Chinese uh, uh, government. You are the boss to give orders. Then followers have to follow those orders. In the US, I think here is more kind of a moral, ship, moral leadership to lead by examples here and try to make sure here our everyone's interests are protected. So I try to give them that answers. Uh -huh. But they cannot say, oh, leadership is hierarchy. Yeah. So how do I respond? That's why I that came to my uh, mind. Yeah. I want to have a comparative <laughs> perspective about how to think of leadership. Another issue here, you talked about those leadership issues authenticity and try to be trusted. But the problem in China now is just opposite. Uh, not authenticity, the corrup corruption. People try to abuse their power. People don't trust. The mistrust is a very big problem in China. Right. So when you lecture those issues to the Chinese audience, yeah. how do they respond yeah. to y'all? Yeah. Well, I, let me uh, describe some of the reactions that I've had because, in my view, um, the responses are just as mixed in China as they are in the U.S. That much of leadership in the U.S. is not morally founded and that a good bit of leadership in China is much more communitarian, much more other-centered than I see in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> and so I think Maybe it's dividing in terms of humanity. That some of humanity chooses to pursue a very self-centered style of leadership, perhaps in the great majority, and some choose to follow a more others-centered. Let me show you some of the audience reactions I've had. Um, my overall impressions are these. The audiences are invariably respectful and attentive, interested, open to learning new things. They expect to learn something new and useful uh, from the time we're together. <coughs> they appear to be very interested in the ethical dimension of leadership, much more so than American audiences. They appear to be unusually respectful of West Point, more so than American audiences. <coughs> and uh, curiously, they they don't want me to stop early. Uh, if you know, if I propose we stop 15 minutes before time, and we've been at it for eight hours, they say, oh no, no, you owe me another 15 minutes. So, uh, so I make the point to go over time, if anything. Some reactions are make it all worthwhile. A young man in Shanghai said to me this. He said, when I came in here this morning, I thought I was in business to get rich, but I'm leaving with a vision that I'm in business to serve other people. You changed my life. And then he asked me, are you going to give us again? I said, yeah, I'm going to Shenzhen. I'll. And he brought his whole team, his leadership team, to Shenzhen because he wanted them to hear the same thing. He thought it would change the way they led their company. Uh, Middle-aged lady in Kunming, she said to me after a day together, she said, I was up all night talking to my family about how I want to change the way I lead our business. Company VP in Qingdao. I did not touch upon anything spiritual, but she said, Today you touched my soul. Other reactions. <clears throat> um, company president said, You changed the way we work and invited me to come back a year later. And then that same company president said, Man, the good changes in attitude and behavior have faded since your last visit. We don't know why. And so we were able to work further on reinstating, reinvigorating, uh, re-inspiring those changes. And it was at the end of that session that one of the VPs said, you touched my soul. The CEO told me on arrival, this was a big company, hundreds of employees, 300 leaders I mentioned. 
And the CEO told me that the senior VP, the, the essentially the chief operating officer, was the main problem. But as I watched for three days, I realized that it was the CEO who was the problem. It was the CEO who did not know how to lead. And that VP was struggling with how to improve the company when the CEO didn't understand. After my lectures, that VP told the CEO, this teaching is excellent. It's just what we need right now. The response of the CEO, this approach is so unusual, it will require careful study and consideration before we make any changes. That CEO didn't buy it. Did not buy the idea of any of these changes that I proposed. Um, very thoughtful senior VP in Changsha, after my presentation over dinner, he said, I want to ask you, so this is really very good teaching, but do you really think this will work in China? And as we talked on, I, I knew that he meant, do you think this idealistic other-centered ethic will work in China? To which I said this, I gave him two responses. First of all, yes, I know it will work. Jim Collins gave us as near an empirical proof as we'll ever get that this approach builds great companies. So if you really want to build a great company that provides great value to your customer and great employment to your people and great return to your investors and great citizenship to the, the communities you're located in, this will work if that's what you want to do. But, he said, the real question is this. How many Chinese or Americans will want to follow this other center of philosophy? How many would prefer to pursue a totally self-centered philosophy rather than an other-centered philosophy? And that is such a fundamental human question. That's why I suggest that that uh, people divide over this question in the United States just as much as they divide over this question in China. And I have found people in China and in the U.S. on both sides. For example, in Shanghai, one CEO sent his assistant up to me before I'd even started the lecture and said, he wants to know in the first 30 minutes what is the essence of West Point leadership. <laughs> And if you don't give it to him, he's going to leave. I said, wait a minute. You know, I've got all day here. I prefer to have three days, but I've only got one day. And he wants to give me only 30 minutes. I said, I, I can't do it. And so when I quite consciously failed to give him what he wanted, he left. Um, last chart here. Some of them say, you don't understand our culture. This comes back to your point of protecting face. You don't understand our culture when you suggest, for example, being candid with others, never lying to others, questioning my boss, even from a foundation of trust. I suggest that you build a relationship that is so trustful that you can speak to your boss in private about ways in which she or he can improve. Caring about rank and file workers. They're caring so much as to make sure that they're safe in their job and that they're reasonably compensated. So, um, some have said, I don't agree that you can change a person's character. I do my best to convince them that we can and that it is worth the effort to consciously, intentionally, seek to improve my character and, and that of the people on the leadership team. Some people simply want to change the subject. They, they want to talk about something else. Um, one gentleman said, why don't you use Mao as an exemplar instead of Sun, Sun Zhong Shen? <laughs> uh, some say, well, what do you think of the ethics of Bush or Obama or Wall Street, Goldman Sachs? You know, they want to talk about ethics in the United States. I've talked about it uh, in China. And so they want to know, well, how do I feel about ethics of what's going on in our own country? And on the issue of, of leadership in the Pacific, you know, I have to say, I understand why 
China would say, why does the U.S. think it needs to be the leader in the Pacific Ocean, or especially in the South China Sea? That's a perfectly reasonable question, it seems to me, uh, and one worthy of debate within the United States. So those are the reactions. Now, now let me turn it back to you. Questions? Um, what are your comments, observations, and questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering if you met with or uh, studied the ethics and what's taught at the Chinese equivalent of West Point. What do they teach their leaders? How does it differ, perhaps, in concepts? I have not been able to. Uh, I have colleagues who would love to be able to be in touch with the military in China, and we're not able to. It's, it's probably the, the last bastion of security that. Um, you know, myself as a former military officer trying to make contact with Chinese military is something that's very sensitive. So I don't know uh, how that is done or, or what is done. I do um, hear a lot from people about um, religion in China. It appears to me in talking with people that there's a hunger for something to give life more meaning than just acquiring more wealth and more stuff. And they're looking, you know, they're, they're very anxious to talk about Buddhism and Taoism and, and Confucianism and so forth. And so I enjoy those conversations very much. Someone else?
to pursue something more meaningful in my life. You know, in uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the lowest level needs are the food, clothing, shelter, the things that get you out of poverty. But uh, the only thing that money helps you do is get out of poverty. It doesn't help you meet the higher level needs beyond the first level. And so getting people to, to move to the higher levels of self-fulfillment and satisfaction and encouraging them and helping them see that as a, as a personal goal that will enrich their lives is kind of what I try to do. Right, so do you ever think anything about to Like in China too, like like um, the, um, the, the they become a, a healthy business sector. Oh yes, yes. Uh, this group right here, uh, a young man, a, a Chinese man, spoke to them about ways in which they could become involved in helping to provide medical needs in um, indigenous people villages and. Many hands went up, yes, I want to be involved, I want to help. I'll donate, I'll go, I'll spend time. Now these are all successful entrepreneurs here who are at a place where they have risen out of poverty and they were very anxious to go and be helpful to others who are less advantaged. Any more questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Oh yes, uh, it's my great honor, sir. And I see your uh, your book for the last point. You also have a Chinese name, right? Yes. That is Du Lin Song. So you have the same surname with me in Chinese. Oh really? Oh. <laughs> yes. We're probably and, related. Oh yes, yes. She's and a my question. From yes. She's a visiting scholar from China. I am a visiting scholar in CCUSC, and I am from Shanghai, from a military medical university. So I see all of the pictures you showed us for the West Point, for all of the freshmen to be a senior student, to be a military officer. Uh, I think that is very similar and familiar to our university. But the most very um, difference between these two universities in West Point and my university is the religion's worship. I see that. So in China, for all of the military universities, we didn't have this one. And I want to know, could you tell me what about the religion's worship play the role in the leadership in military university or non-military companies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, what role does religion play in yeah. the military? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was actually tested in the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And it was argued successfully that um, in order to, for men and women to be effective in the military, the leaders need to tend to the whole person, to all of the needs of each soldier, <coughs> and that to pretend or to act on a presumption that there is no spiritual need in most human beings is to deny a, a genuine part of who we are as human beings. And so on that argument, uh, it was argued, the effectiveness of the military requires that we um, support the spiritual needs of our soldiers. And so the um, United States military forces hire chaplains from a wide variety of, of uh, religious backgrounds and pay them to serve the spiritual needs of the soldier. And some of those soldiers will not appreciate it, but when the really hard times come, they turn to the chaplain. So um, for the religion service from the university, the soldiers or the students feel more better um, than without this one? Yes. Okay. Yes, it, it, they're, they appreciate the fact that that in their life they do need something more. Okay, just like you said, sir, in China we also have some religion thinkings, just like um, Buddha, Taoism, or others. But in the military we didn't, we do the forbidden for this one. All of the students, when they go to the university for the first year, they also make an oath, but 
That else is too un- honest to the military and the country. It is not so other religions thinking. Uh-huh. Yes, that's the difference. Well, in at West Point, the um, the motto is much like a duty, honor, country. Yeah. Uh, and there are many who are committed to those ideals who may not be knowingly religious, but many others uh, believe that the foundation of their commitment to duty on our country mm-hmm. is from their religious faith. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and because of that, it's important that the service provides support to those who are of religious frame of mind and to those who are not but may in time need to turn in that direction for some uh, Okay, yeah, I think we can just uh, uh, conclude with here is a very interesting talk, very good talk. And uh, those issues I think uh, should be very important for the Chinese uh, uh, leaders to learn. Hopefully they would uh, appreciate ethics in the leadership in China. That's a very important issue. Uh, before we uh, thank uh, Dr. Donathan, uh, I want to uh, mention our next uh, uh, event. Uh, on the 24th, we have a Polish a young scholar from Poland. Uh, he spent quite a few years in China. He's uh, just uh, got his professorship in Poland. He is coming uh, to do some research, so I invite him to give a talk about his observation in China in the last several years about uh, China's uh, diplomatic I mean, foreign policy rhetorics and also foreign policy uh, deeds. That's what he tried to figure out. Then, on um, uh, March uh, 7th, se- Dan- 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 is that 7th? Uh, 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 Stanley Rosen. I mean, we originally tried to uh, invite uh, Rick Baum uh, from UCLA uh, to talk about his his book, China uh, Hands, I mean, not China Hands, China Watchers. He has been a China Watch for uh, 40, 50 years. He wrote that book. Uh, but his health has a problem, so he cannot come. We have uh, Stanley Rosen from the University of Southern California uh, coming to talk about, uh, he's a director of uh, East Asian Studies at the uh, USC. So he will talk about China's propaganda uh, strategy and uh, China's uh, soft power. Uh, aspects. And uh, then on um, uh, April 6, we have uh, a speaker from the State Department. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. Uh, so he will, uh, because China's relationship with Africa has been so important, increasingly uh, important for Americans and also for Chinese uh, to uh, be concerned. And he, although he's working on African affairs, he has got involved in a lot of uh, interactions with the Chinese side. So he will talk about African China, African U.S. US relationship, bringing China factor uh, to discuss the U.S. China uh, African relationship. And uh, then end of that month, we have scholar from Duke University uh, to talk about China's uh, media. Uh, uh, industry media development. Uh, then in May, we have a speaker from Taiwan. He was the foreign ministry. He just left the foreign ministry. He was the chairman of the policy planning at the Taiwan's foreign ministry. So he will come to talk about Taiwan issues. Uh, then we have our annual uh, China Center uh, uh, symposium, which now is scheduled on May 4th and May 5th. The topic of the symposium is uh, Beyond History, Reconciliation, and the New Sources of Conflict between China and its neighbors. So for that conference, because China will try to figure out China relationships with its neighbors, we invite scholars from China. And this conference is uh, co-sponsored by Zhejiang University in China and the Taha Institute in Beijing. So we invite scholars from China, uh, from India, from uh, South Korea, from Japan. So we want to have those neighboring countries' uh, perceptions, views of uh, China's 
relationships with them from historical and also from current perspective. So please um, pay attention to uh, our announcements of those uh, events, including those uh, that uh, uh, annual symposium. We hope you can join us. With that, please join me again to thank Dr. Donaldson for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.